Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is John Abizade, who is a retired U.S. Army general and former commander of the Central Command. He is the first Annenberg Visiting Fellow at the Hoover Institution and this year's 2008 uh, Admiral Chester Nimitz uh, Lecturer at UC Berkeley. Uh, General Abizade, welcome to Berkeley. Thanks, Harry. Thanks for having me here. Where were you born and raised? Well, I was born in Redwood City, California, and I lived there for about 12 years or so. Spent some time on and off in San Francisco, but for the most part it was Redwood City. And uh, then when I got ready to go to high school, we moved up into the Sierra Nevada Mountains in Mono County, Colville, California. And I graduated from high school there, and after that was into the Army. And uh, looking back, how do you think your parents shape your thinking about the world? Well, my, my dad in particular really shaped my, my thinking about the world. He was a World War II Navy vet. He had served in the Solomons and in the Pacific. He had seen a lot of action on a, on a small ship in the middle of the Pacific. Uh, he would traveled all over the world as a result of that Navy service. And it was clear to me that 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 service to him was really one of the most important things in his life. And uh, as we were growing up, my, my mother died when I was rather young, and he continued to raise my sister and I. And I have great admiration for having grown up with this man who talked about service, loved service, and uh, advocated it. And, and you said you, you joined the Army. Where, where did you get your education, actually? Uh, 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 before going into the Army, actually? Well, before going into the Army, I graduated from Colville High School. Mm -hmm. Total school population of about 105 students. Certainly one of the smaller schools in the state of was California. Was there an ROTC? <clears throat> no, no, mm -hmm. there was, wasn't an ROTC. There wasn't a lot of things going on at Colville. <laughs> I see. Uh, but there were many things going on at Colville at the same time. For example, I wanted to study German, and in order to study German, I had to take a correspondence course, and they allowed me to do that. So it uh, it was a good experience growing up in a rural county, in a small area, small school. We had uh, excellent instructors, and I think they prepared me about as well as could be expected to, to go on to West Point. Mm -hmm. And and so that's you did go to West Point, and, and talk did. about your education there. Did it prepare you? for all the, the changes that the military was going to have to confront throughout your career? Well, you know, West Point prepares you for life in a very interesting way. It gives you discipline, it gives you focus, it gives you a way of approaching problem solving. Uh, West Point's not the type of place to go if you're not committed to being a, a, an officer in the United States Army. It, I, I knew I wanted to be a soldier, I was committed to doing that, and I thought that West Point would give me a good opportunity to do that. I initially found the, the academic rigor there pretty tough. Mm -hmm. Not to mention the military rigor, but I was expecting that. The academic rigor was, was very tough, especially with regards to mathematics and engineering. But over time, I learned how to work my way through the, uh, the system, and I enjoyed being there. And, and your career is really one of, of moving between uh, the university and, and actually study. I mean, in, in the sense that you got a master's at some point at Harvard and you were an Olmsted uh, fellow to Jordan. Uh, talk a little about that. I mean, what, how did, in what ways did that enhance your, uh, uh, your education and, and prepare you for the world you had to confront as a general? It's very interesting that the military invests very heavily in officer education. Sometimes it's within military schools. Every now and then you can go outside of military schools. West Point, for example, provides a, a record number of Rhodes and Truman Scholars. It's uh, quite a good institution. But uh, I, I graduated from West Point. Uh, I had been interested in the Olmsted Scholar Program and the old Olmsted Scholar Program provided an officer with an opportunity essentially to get away from the Army, 
for two years, go to a foreign university, learn a foreign language, and then come back and, and go to an American university to, to finish up the, the master's degree work. So I selected the University of Jordan as a place that I'd like to go to. I learned how to speak Arabic. A lot of people think because of my last name I learned how to speak Arabic at home, but really it was the Army that taught me how. And I went to the University of Jordan and had that opportunity, then on to Harvard. And, and I really regarded that, that training at both Harvard and Jordan as very, very important to being able to allow me to, to move through my career in a way that was understanding of different cultures, different problems, and certainly the last five years of my life uh, in the middle of the Middle East. It, it helped a lot. Helped a lot. Uh, what, what led you uh, to choose uh, Jordan, and, and what year was that? Let's, let's, because that, that was very early in terms of uh, uh, 70s? We, yeah, we, I, I started out in the program somewhere around 1978 or so, and, and I was in the Middle East from 78 to 80, and then Harvard 80 to 81. I, th I think that's about right during that, that time period. So, so it, I, the reason I point this out is because the, the, that Middle East was going to change. So you were there in a way uh, at the beginning of the, of the changes that would really affect this, this whole period of your service. Well, it's interesting you say that, Harry. The, the Middle East is always changing, and the Middle East is never <laughs> right. changing. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> I mean, the Middle East is a very, very interesting place. But what was so interesting about going to Jordan during that time period, uh, it was also the time period of the Iranian Revolution. Mm -hmm. And it sent really what I would call a religious shockwave through the region in a way that was absolutely noticeable. And there's always a lot of turmoil at, at Middle Eastern universities, the University of Jordan no less so than, than other places. And when the university would close down because of the inevitable riot, I'd end up going out and train with the Jordanian Special Forces in the Army because I was a military officer. So it, it was a good opportunity to learn not only about the civil society in Jordan, but also about the military society in Jordan. And of course, in the Arab world in particular, militaries play very, very different roles in the societies than here in the States. Mm -hmm. and, and at Harvard, I, I think I read somewhere that you wrote a paper that your, the prof said was the outstanding paper that he had read. What was that paper on for your master's? Well, the, the paper was on Saudi Arabian defense concepts. And my professor, really a very, very distinguished Middle Eastern historian and political scientist, Nadav Safran, uh, just a, a remarkable man. He he steered me towards trying to understand better what the uh, the Saudis based their decision making on with regard to how they spent their money for defense, what their priorities were, what their problems were, how much of it was related to internal versus external politics, etc. And so uh, having an opportunity to do that research and also haven't been in Saudi Arabia when I was in Jordan. One thing about being in Jordan, I had the chance to travel all over the Middle East, and I, I literally traveled all over the Arab world and, and had a chance to see how things were done in many countries in different ways. Help us understand now what what is it, what are the skills required uh, for uh, being a, an effective soldier these days? Uh, that, that the criterion have changed in, in the course of your career, and, and it, it's very complicated now, isn't it? Well, it, it gets more complicated as you go up the, the rank ladder. But early on, the, the single most important thing, and throughout your career, the single most important thing is to be able to lead people. It, it's so vital that you understand people, that you're able to convince them to do tough and difficult things. and of course, in combat, American soldiers don't take the hill because they're afraid of you. They take the hill because they respect their comrades and because they respect their leaders, and they know that they've got to take the hill in order to get the job done. So throughout your career, you're, you're always having to deal with uh, issues of, of leadership, and that's critically important. But as you go higher through the ranks, we talk about the world as being tactical or operational or strategic, and you find yourself going through these various levels of command. As a young officer, it's tactical. How do you take the hill? Uh, then you get operational and you start using bigger units. And then ultimately, when you become, say, like I was, the commander of the Central Command, it's strategic and you're having to advise the President of the United States, Secretary of Defense to the best of your ability. 
And, and, and so as you progress through this, this ladder of changing circumstances, you've got to be more culturally aware, you've got to be able to understand the broader civilian society, you've got to understand how our broader government works, how non-governmental organizations work, how alliances work. It's, no American officer has ever served in combat since, really, I, I can hardly think when it was, maybe the Spanish-American War without being part of an alliance. Mm -hmm. and, and it's pretty interesting when you think about it. We're always working in an international environment. We're always working with other countries. We work within the NATO alliance. We work within the United Nations. But throughout my career, it's always been a broad exposure, an increasingly broad exposure towards working with different cultures, different problems, and different international organizations. And I, I, I think that allows you to grow. And, and of course, you also have increasingly complex organizations that you have to command. Although, the interesting thing is that the, one of the toughest things to command is your first platoon. Mm -hmm. you, you've only <laughs> got somewhere between 30 and 40 people there, but they're the first 30 or 40 people you've ever led. And learning how to lead there is absolutely essential to success. Explain to our audience uh, what the Central Command is and what what territory uh, you covered, because it it's a term that might not be familiar with the general public. The United States military is is really given a broad geographic area to operate in. In other words, the entire globe is in one way or another covered by a military command. I think people are familiar with the European Command and the Pacific Command. But the Central Command was essentially created in the, the early days of tension that was developing between the United States and the Soviet Union over the strategic resources of the Middle East and gradually came to encompass 27 different countries. It went from the former Soviet Central Asian Republic, starting with Kazakhstan on down through Afghanistan and Pakistan over and across Iran, the center of the Levant, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan. Uh, interestingly enough, it doesn't include Israel, does not include Israel. It includes Saudi Arabia, Yemen, smaller Gulf states. And then it crosses the Suez Canal, goes to Egypt, Sudan, uh, down into Ethiopia, Eritrea, Djibouti, and Kenya. It's a very, very dynamic area. It's an area where uh, the richest nations on earth exist and the poorest nations exist. It's primarily a, an Islamic area, but it's an area where there's constant turmoil, terrorism, insurgency, and of course it's the area that the world depends upon for the global flow of oil. So it's a very, very interesting area. And, and it doesn't mean, by the way, that when you, you're assigned 27 countries that you own them, you certainly don't. But any military operation that would take place there, whether it's people that work in an embassy or people that work on training military forces in a particular country or big military operations such as Iraq or Afghanistan, uh, you have the responsibility to uh, direct and coordinate and synchronize. And I, I would also finish by saying that these operational areas are not just Army areas. They're Army, Navy, mm -hmm. Air Force, Marine Corps, and you are responsible generally for synchronizing those four services as a joint commander and synchronizing the international forces that work with you. And I think people sometimes lose sight of the fact that there are many, many different countries that work with us. Matter of fact, in my headquarters in the Central Command, there were over 80 different nations represented there with military liaison officers, just to give you mm -hmm. an idea about how broadly international mm -hmm. the effort was. Mm -hmm. uh, explain to us how you interface with the other parts of the U.S. government in that region? In the region, you interface with the, the ambassadors almost on a daily basis. And because of your position as a high military leader of the United States and because you're regionally based, you become a person that frequently talks to the leaders of the region, President Musharraf, President Karzai, uh, the Prime Minister of Iraq, uh, you, you name it, uh, you, you have access and uh, opportunity to talk to them. Primarily you talk to the military officers, of course, but over time you also find yourself getting to know the, the kings and sheikhs and other uh, key leaders of, uh, of the region. You also interface with the U.S. government in, in Washington. So, for example, you have to 
conduct meetings uh, in your own area to organize the U.S. government effort to the extent that you can. Um, you also have to deal frequently with the Central Intelligence Agency and the other intelligence agencies to understand what's going on. But back, uh, back in Washington, there's an interagency process that's going on, and you are frequently represented in the interagency. But, but most importantly, what you're trying to do is organize the military forces under your command. And for example, in my command, the Central Command had the uh, multinational force in Iraq commander, who was a four-star commander that worked for me. Uh, the commander in Afghanistan, who currently is a four-star commander, he uh, also would work for me, although the, the, the command relationships have changed over time. And w we had a small command in Djibouti in the Horn of Africa worked under my command and then there were Navy, Air Force, Special Operations commands that were regional commands that reported to me as well. So I mean it's a complex organization, it's a big organization. At its height it was probably 350,000 Americans and another 500,000 or so uh, partner nations, uh, partner forces that were participating and currently it's probably closer to 250,000. If uh, you were asked to, to brief the next president, not the top secret part, but just kind of give him the lay of the land, what, what, what do you see as the problems uh, emerging, you know, in this area? And a lot of our problems uh, uh, are, are things that we're going to have to address or find solutions for will be coming from, from that area. I, I would tell the president, look, Mr. President, you need not to only worry about Iraq and you need to not only worry about Afghanistan. Certainly they are immediate problems that we've got to be concerned with. But you need to look at the broader regional problems and the broader ideological movements that are in the area. And the first thing I'd say is that there is a, a uh, very serious ideological movement that is a Sunni extremist, Sunni Islamic extremist movement led by Osama bin Laden and exemplified by Al-Qaeda. Uh, that is a movement that certainly isn't mainstream yet in the Middle East, but it's just not a group of terrorists. It's a movement, it's an idea, and we need to understand that that idea is implacably opposed to American presence and indeed seeks to dominate the region with a form of religious extremism that most people in the region don't want to be ascendant. Then I'd say the next big problem is the rise of Iranian Shia revolutionary ideology and again it's it's an ideological religious movement that is again implacably opposed to American involvement in the region yet uh, at the same time one that may not be at the beginning of its ideological life such as Al-Qaeda but one that that the people of Iran are probably getting tired of and that you, you will have to watch Iranian attempts to dominate the region and and counter them in a way that makes sense over time. Um, the third point I would tell them is that while we're not using our own military forces daily in the Arab-Israeli, better, better said Israeli-Palestinian theater, that you have to understand that the continued corrosive effect of this problem is creating a dynamic where people move to the extremes and it makes the region very, very unstable. And then the, the, the final fourth big problem that I would make sure he understands is that one of the reasons we're so heavily engaged in the Middle East that none of us can deny is our continued dependence upon Middle Eastern oil. And, and in order to gain diplomatic and political and military maneuver room, we need to figure out how to reduce our dependence over time, knowing that there's no easy solution to this on the flow of Middle Eastern oil. And clearly, American military power has to confront Sunni Islamic extremism. It has to contain Iranian ambitions. Um, diplomatic power, political power has to do what it can to move the Arab-Israeli process forward. Uh, but ultimately, it's the American military shield that keeps the flow of oil moving. And it should come as no surprise to us that our enemies are trying to disrupt that, that movement. And, and when I say our enemies, I, I don't want it to sound as if this is American domination because it's not. American military power keeps the flow of oil going not just for the United States of America but for our friends and our, our allies and, and the producing nations.
so what you just described raises a question about distinguishing between non-state actors and states like Iran that are uh, adversaries or potential adversaries. Uh, talk a little about, uh, you know, what we have to do to deal with, with two different kinds of problems, although they both may pose threats. Yeah, it's a very interesting question, especially with regard to al-Qaeda, because as you've clearly said, it is a non-state phenomenon, and unfortunately it may be the beginning of the way things are going to be in the 21st century, where we deal a lot more with super-empowered non-state actors. And al-Qaeda, you, you have to give them credit for what they've achieved. I, I have no admiration for them, uh, but on the other hand, they've managed to attack us at home. They've managed to attack really in a broad range of countries around the world in a way that's uh, brought their cause to the attention of many. They recruit, they train, they proselytize, they organize on the virtual space and the internet in a way that's very, very sophisticated, very dangerous. And, and yet they, they purvey a ideology that, an ideology that really isn't very popular with the people in the region. It's very extreme form of Islam. As a matter of fact, most of my Islamic friends will say, don't even use the word Islam in the, mm -hmm. the same sentence with al-Qaeda. But the problem is that al-Qaeda views itself as a religious organization, and it's extreme, uh, but it bases itself religiously. And so, you, you know, you have to mobilize not just military power against this problem, but, but a lot of other soft power, economic, diplomatic, political, informational, to, uh, to deal with it. Now, a nation state like Iran, on the other hand, because it is a nation state, is more easily deterrable. It's more easily deterrable by the classic elements of diplomacy, military power, political action, etc. And so, uh, on the other hand, it's interesting to look at, at Iran and see how they sponsor non-state actors in places such as southern Lebanon, eastern Saudi Arabia, southern Iraq. Eastern Afghanistan, and um, I think these challenges will continue to bedevil the next president and probably the next president after that for quite a while. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, when you say that Iran is deterrable, uh, help us understand that, because I'm a student of Ken Waltz, and Ken Waltz didn't worry that much about uh, 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 possession of a nuclear uh, weapon by a country if they could be deterred. Well. Harry, this whole issue of proliferation of nuclear weapons is one that we all need to have a frank discussion about. And while we discredited the argument to a certain extent because we didn't find a nuclear program active in Iraq like we thought we would, the truth of the matter is small groups of terrorists are not necessarily a problem for a great nation unless they have access or the capability of achieving a breakthrough on the weapon of mass destruction front. And in the Middle East today, in a period of great instability, in a country like Pakistan, for example, you do have to worry about the possibility that a weapon could be either advertently or inadvertently transferred to the hands of uh, extremists. And if they get their hands on it, I'm convinced that they'll do everything in their power to use it against us or our, our interests in the region. And it's actually our worst nightmare to think of a nuclear weapon being used in the 21st century or a sophisticated chemical or biological weapon. So this issue about doing everything possible to prevent the proliferation of nuclear weapons in that part of the world I think is essential. And so to think of Iran holding a nuclear weapon is to just add another bit of instability into a region that's inherently unstable. And the Iranian government may very well go through another revolutionary phase. And were they to be armed with a nuclear weapon and in a period of great instability, are they then still deterrable? I'm not so sure. And so I think when things hold together, like they did between the United States and the Soviet Union, where you had a balance of nuclear terror, essentially, that deterred people from using the weapons, it's one thing, but when you proliferate the weapons to uh, unstable states, it creates a whole different dynamic that I think all of us need to have. When I say all of us, I mean the international community needs to have a frank and clear understanding about where we're heading into the future. And clearly, technologies are such today 
that it is not out of the realm of possible that you can make a breakthrough. Mm -hmm. well, one of the challenges that the uh, next president is going to be confronted with and, and future CENCOM uh, 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 chairs such as yourself is th this question of, okay, you have a deteriorating state, a failing state, a failed state, whatever, and, and the, the choice has to be made uh, between uh, uh, a military, you know, actually taking action, taking military action, possibly invading, but then also worrying about what happens afterward. So the, the and, and this seems like a, a really big problem for the military to think about, namely being t to handle the bad guys in a military operation, winning that operation, using the best technology, relying on the revolution in military affairs, but then what happens after that? Talk about the challenges there for the next president and for the next, uh, uh, for the future leaders of CENCOM? Well, we, we talked about the, the four broad challenges in the region, but the two immediate problems that the next president will face will, will be the requirement to stabilize Iraq, stabilize Afghanistan, or should they decide otherwise, to begin the process of moving forces out of the region regardless of those two countries stabilizing. Now, I think the biggest challenge that everybody has to really understand is that taking a state that is either failing, has failed, or uh, needs to stabilize in, in a revolutionary direction, in a completely different direction like Iraq, requires an awful lot of time. And it requires building institutions. And you, you think of our own republic, how long it took us to go from the first shots of the revolution to when we finally ratified the Constitution, and then nearly a hundred years later we still had to fight a civil war to to, to sort all that out in a, in a, in a way that uh, uh, was bad for our own country. So, I mean, these things take time. They're evolutionary. Uh, they are slow. They're tedious. You can imagine trying to build a new army in Iraq is, uh, is a tough, tough thing to do. But you just can't build a new army by handing out weapons. You have to build a new way of thinking. The old Iraqi army terrorized its people. It filled up the... the, the, the uh, mass graves with innocent people and the the new Iraqi army has to learn how to be a servant of the state. Will they be able to do that? Well, they won't be able to if we don't help them, if we don't try to educate them. And so, you know, there's a certain requirement that the new president will show some patience, will show some courage, and will look out there and say, to what extent is the military overextended? in particular the United States Army. And how can we over time relieve the pressure on that military commitment? And also understand that nation building isn't primarily a military responsibility, it's a governmental responsibility that requires the State Department, other agencies of the U.S. government, international agencies, international partners, non-governmental organizations to all come together in a way that pull together uh, to allow the, 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 uh, the place to stabilize. So clearly we have to internationalize the effort more and we have to put more soft power to play in places like Iraq and Afghanistan. Now, you know, we put more forces in Iraq in order to gain time and, and it appears as if it is having an effect and it, it's, we're all, all of us soldiers are very gratified to see that happening. But on the other hand, military forces just gain time for you. You have to be able to move governance forward, economics forward, diplomacy forward. And, and I think the next president's got to say, are we organized to do that properly? Mm -hmm. And if not, how do we need to reform ourselves so that we're going to be more effective in the 21st century? Is our State Department big enough? Do our intelligence agencies have enough authority to be able to get the job done? Can we figure out a way to enlist the people in the region to work primarily against the terrorists in, in a way that we're more behind the scenes as opposed to out front. And, and so I, I can see the new president, whoever it may be, having to fashion a strategy that continues to confront al-Qaeda, that continues to contain Iran, that continues to do its best to stabilize Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, but also moves more towards helping the people in the region help themselves and also it still has to protect the flow of oil. 
And, and I, I think that can be done over time with less military force and more other elements of international and national power. So, so in addition, because you know we, we hear a lot about uh, the military is going to need more funds to rebuild, which is undoubtedly true. But but you're suggesting that it's really important to de to build up the other institutions of the U.S. government that have to be part of the team that solves the stabilization and na nation building processes. Absolutely. A state, a good State Department officer in the field leading a team of soldiers, people from the Department of Agriculture, people from the Department of uh, Homeland Security, people from all sorts of other agencies of the U.S. government, it is probably worth more than a battalion of infantry or a brigade of infantry in many particular circumstances, especially when <clears throat> the country's trying to move towards stabilization like they are in Afghanistan. So <clears throat> it can't only be about fighting. Fighting has to be part of it, don't get me wrong. I'm mm -hmm. saying we're not to the point yet where it's stable enough to, uh, to move forward without military forces. But there's this belief in some segments of our society that you have to achieve perfect stability in the security situation first uh, before you move the other elements of national power forward and actually that's not true. You've got to move them all forward together in, in the right mix at the right time. And I, I think we've got to reevaluate how we do that. I, we should not have an argument about whether there's enough people in the State Department. Now, we should have an argument about whether there's enough people in the United States Army. You know, you keep hearing people say, well, there's not enough troops in Iraq. Mm -hmm. Actually, that's not the issue. There are as many troops in Iraq as we can almost possibly have. You are either in Iraq coming home from Iraq mm -hmm. or getting ready to go to Iraq. And, and, and so the problem that the new president will have is looking at his land power, the Army and the Marine Corps in particular, and asking himself the question or herself the question, whatever it may be, look, I, I've got this force that's deployed here. It's very heavily engaged. I've got a force that's recovering or preparing. Do I have a force that's ready to deal with the problem that shows up in Iran or North Korea or some other unknown mm -hmm. place? Can I deal with the problem in Sudan, a genocide? Can I deal with some other major problem with land power uh, given the state of stretch of the armed forces of the United States? And the military leaders of the country need to tell the new president, Mr. President, we are having uh, some some problems here with being able to maintain the force. And the biggest problem we need to talk about is whether or not these young professional non-commissioned officers and young officers, the majors and the captains, will stay with the team. Uh, you can only stay away from home so long. I'm, already this war has lasted a long, long time. So we've got to figure out how to use our forces wisely and either make the Army big enough to meet the commitments or learn how to bring the Army in the field down and compensate by international and other means of national power. And I believe that those are things that we can do. But continuing to stretch the land power of the United States to the breaking point would be a very, very unwise move. But there are options and it can be done. Well, one of the, the uh, consequences of the, our recent experience uh, in the last uh, six years is the burden, it seems, that it's placed on the American soldier and the American soldier's family. And, and this operate, seems to operate at various levels. For example, our soldier really needs to know a lot. In other words, it's, it's as if he's got to work with a handheld computer to direct targets. I'm, I'm, I'm doing a, a, an ideal type here on the one hand, but on the other hand, he's suddenly got to put down his computer, go into a community, and meet with the city council and help organize it. it it's really yeah. a, 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 a heavy burden that may be too much, and that may be why you're suggesting that we need other parts of the government there. Well, I, I don't think the operational and tactical style is too much. I, matter of fact, when I've been like I say, in the Middle East for nearly five years, up until the point where I retired. And I watched our troops very carefully in very, very difficult and demanding circumstances. And it's just like you said, Harry, 
one minute you're out there fighting the enemy and you're fighting ferociously and you're fighting to win and you're, you're delivering all the means of violence you can to destroy that enemy. And then maybe with an hour or two, you're doing what you need to do to repair a school or to talk to a local leader or to deal with some other community problem that's developed in the area that you're responsible for. And I think our troops have actually done a magnificent job in dealing with those complexities and that people often don't understand how tough it is for them, uh, but they've done very, very well. The problem for them is constant deployments in very, very difficult and demanding circumstances over time, away from their families, uh, in a way that, that there's no uh, opportunity for them to, to, to take a decent rest at, at home and, and organize their families, etc. Um, it's clear to me that this problem is going to last for a while. It's a long-term problem. It's also clear to me that we're probably using too much military force to deal with the problems in the region. And while it's essential that we stabilize Iraq and Afghanistan, in my, in my viewpoint, we also have to, to understand that it's essential that we, we start moving more towards international and, and uh, other sources of soft power to, to help out in, in that uh, respect. And in today's world, which is increasingly interconnected, we're able to do more. And I, I think you'll see uh, whatever president shows up come into a, a pretty clear realization that that there are other ways to, to deal with the problem of the Middle East than just military means alone. Uh, in, in the Iraq war, uh, and you talked a little about this yesterday, uh, uh, there was a, a refusal by uh, the governing group to, to essentially mobilize the country, to do all sorts of things uh, to generate uh, uh, a sense of the importance of what the military was doing. Uh, is that a, a fair uh, assessment? And what can we do about that? I mean, we don't, we don't want to mobilize the country so we think the military is the only solution, which you just said, you know, we, we've got to get away from, basically. But on the other hand, we want to be able to support the military in what they do. And here, you know, one, one thinks of all of these horror stories that have emerged about the way uh, our soldiers are being treated, those that have been injured, uh, you know, and so on, the, 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 the provision of adequate uh, 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 armor and so on for the vehicles and so on. Talk a little about that, because it's a fine line. We don't want to become a military state that sees all of our problems in military terms, but on the other hand, we want the military to have yeah. the support they need. It's a political problem. Well, mobilization of the society to deal with the problem is a political problem. And how we talk about it is a political problem. How we talk to our people about what we need to do and how we organize our bureaucracy, these are all problems associated with political leadership. And I don't think it's fair to say that our political leadership has failed. I, I, and I didn't mean to imply that yesterday. Uh, matter of fact, I, I don't think we're anywhere close to failure. I believe that our bureaucracy in particular is not up to the task of dealing with 21st century problems. And, and I think it needs to be reformed. And I think there are many insights that uh, can be provided as a result of our experience over the past seven years since 2001 that would tell us that the State Department needs to be bigger, that the authorities of the Central Intelligence Agency need to be greater, that, that uh, organizational capability within the rest of the United States government needs to be brought to bear. and that. People such as the young people here at the University of California, Berkeley, can be part of this, not just through military means alone. They don't have to join the Army, Navy, Air Force, or Marine Corps. But they could join the State Department. They could be uh, a member of some other element of the government. Or they could join a non-governmental organization, people that are building schools, people that are uh, building roads, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and as I as I think of the military community and how deeply engaged in this battle we are, and as I go around Palo Alto, California, or Berkeley, California, it, it's clear that, that we're not completely engaged the same way the military community is. How do we collectively share the burden more if we think it's a worthy burden to share? 
I, I personally think that we've, uh, we've got a great, wonderful group of young people who are looking for opportunities to serve the country, and we, we should figure out, uh, and it's just not young people, by the way. It's amazing how many older people have asked, look, I'm a retired engineer. I'd like to go to Iraq and help out. How can I do that? Those mechanisms are not easy, and we, we, should, we should have that conversation with our people. Okay, how do we get more people to be involved in this problem in the Middle East if we believe that this is a problem uh, worthy of spending uh, the, the time and sacrifice necessary to solve? Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about some of the problems that came up uh, uh, for the institution of the military in the, in the course of the conduct of these two wars. And, and, and I want to uh, ask you, first of all, about the Geneva Conventions and the question of torture and how uh, the military can fix things so, you know, we don't get uh, isolated incidents like happened at Abu Ghraib again. I know that there was a lot of uh, concern among the JAGs uh, in the conduct of this war about directions that, that were being taken from Washington that could have possibly sent the wrong signal. Well, we should beware of introducing any ambiguity to soldiers in the field. And to the extent that they would read a newspaper article and think that there was somehow or other some change in whether or not we were applying the Geneva Conventions was, uh, w w was something that w we really couldn't afford to have happen. I, I, look. The United States military does not condone torture. What happened in Abu Ghraib was a huge stain on our honor, and it happened while I was in command. A and all of us really rolled up our sleeves after that and said, look, we have got to ensure that our younger people understand that we've got to treat people, even people uh, that are trying to kill us that are in our custody, uh, with dignity and respect to the extent that we can. And w w really, there is no place for torture. I, I, I believe that we've got to conduct ourselves in a way that uh, allows us to be able to win this war within our value system. And I believe the vast majority of soldiers believe that as well. So um, on the other hand, Harry, when bullets start flying, when people start dying, when combat is engaged, it, it's not easy to turn your mental machinery off and uh, immediately walk away from the brutality of what you just were doing and, and uh, become a, a, a person that, that can act rationally. So it's a tough thing. There's no more disciplined force that has ever been fielded than the United States military. We do a tremendously good job in preventing collateral damage. We do take care of people that are in our custody to the best extent that we can, and we, we absolutely cannot condone uh, walking away from the Geneva Conventions. On the other side, look, wh wh whatever orders that we have from our national command authorities, are the, these are the orders that we'll follow. But we never received any orders that said to torture people. Uh, second question, what about the, the problem of intelligence? And, and here we have to make a distinction between uh, military intelligence uh, versus the, the intelligence you're getting from the CIA and so on. Or do, do we see, uh, or can you suggest to us any improvements that we should look to in the future? Or is this just part of what you've already said, namely putting resources into other agencies of the government? Well, intelligence is, I, I believe that intelligence reform is absolutely essential. What we have an, a, a, an intelligence system that still is more designed to deal with the problems of the Soviet Union than it's designed to deal with the problems of the 21st century. And by the way, our intelligence professionals are incredibly talented and capable people. But if you look at our intelligence bureaucracy, you've got to ask yourself the question, even though we've just reformed it recently, whether the reforms have gone far enough, whether we are organized properly for the 21st century. I'm not sure that I, I have the answers off the top of my head, but I, I do know that this battle against terrorists in particular is more a battle of winning the intelligence war than it is one of, of massive amounts of, of firepower. Yet, I think we all understand clearly that tromping around anywhere in today's world with too much military power creates 
the opportunity for people to move towards the terrorist side or move towards the opposition side of an insurgency, for example. So you, you've, and this doesn't mean we shouldn't use military force. It, it means that we need to use it wisely. And the easiest way to use it wisely is to have an intelligence capability that allows you to precisely target the people that you're trying to go after uh, so that there isn't a lot of collateral uh, difficulties that, that come up on the battlefield. Uh, military contracting, it, it, it's become an issue. And, and I guess the question is there, there are certain tasks that clearly should be done by, some, by entities other than the professional uh, military. How, how do we walk that path to make sure that, that excesses are not uh, committed by private military power? I think in today's 21st century, we'll have a problem that, that is not just going to be one that the U.S. military faces, but everybody faces, in that, that there will be more and more people turning to more and more contractors, especially in failed states, especially in areas where uh, difficult situations arise. Now, the United States military, by the way, has used contractors ever since the Revolutionary War. And most of our logistics capability for many, many years has been uh, contracted through various private firms, etc. What's relatively unique is the coexistence of armed entities that are contracted by, say, the Iraqi government, the State Department, etc., within the same battle space as American soldiers, and and it needs to be carefully synchronized and coordinated. You just can't have uh, so many armed groups moving around the battlefield that are unsynchronized and uncoordinated. And ultimately, it, it creates a dynamic for you that, that creates a problem that uh, uh, some young soldier will have to, have to solve. So uh, coordinating contracts, coordinating contractors is going to be essential, but we should not kid ourselves. If we want to have only our military do security-related things, we'll need to return to the draft. If we're ready to return to the draft politically, fine. Uh, but I doubt very seriously that we are. So it would pretty much tell me that we're going to have to come up with rules, regulations, and ways to hold contracting entities accountable for actions uh, that happen outside the military chain of command. Uh, when I look at your career in pre preparing for this interview, I, I see somebody who really in addition to all of his military successes, as evidenced by the positions that you've held in the military, is somebody who, uh, through training and education and curiosity, basically ha had a sense of the big picture. And by big picture, I mean not just strategically, but also understanding other peoples, understanding their cultures, understanding their language. I I'm curious, as a military leader, how you, uh, when the tire hits the road, how you adjust to, on the one hand, the realities, on the other hand, your understanding of the realities, but also your understanding of what the chain of command understands, the people above you. I mean, it, it would seem to me to be a kind of intellectual and, and emotional challenge. Talk about that a little. I'm, I, well, it, it, it's a very interesting question. You know, as, as a soldier in particular, you always wonder what the next higher level of command is doing to screw up your life. <laughs> you know, what in the world are they doing to make my life difficult? And you're always convinced that your next higher headquarters is your mortal enemy. Uh, but the truth of the matter is that y you've got to be able to recognize what the problems are above you, to the right and to the left of you, and below you. You, you have to be able to have a 360-degree vision of what's going on in order to to make sure that you're successful. But being a soldier it is not about making up your mind about what you do. It's also about following orders. Our oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies and foreign and domestic is also accompanied with the, the, the clear reminder that we will follow the orders of the President of the United States and the officers appointed over us. And we do that. And so. You, you need to study the Constitution, you need to know your legal framework, and then you need to say, when this order is given, I will do it within the best of my ability to achieve success within the military means that I have. And uh, I, I, I think 
soldiers at every level have to be comfortable with that, and, and we are. Mm -hmm. And if we're not, then the Republic has, have, has a huge problem. But we believe that the orders that come from our elected representatives are uh, clearly lawful orders that uh, need to be followed. If we didn't think that, uh, then we would have a moral obligation to do something different. But uh, this is a great republic made, made great by this constitutional framework in which we operate, where people have various responsibilities. Ours is to fight and defend uh, the country, fight for and defend the country, and I, I think we have done that admirably well. Um, I understand that whenever you commit military forces, it creates a dynamic within our body politic about whether it's the right thing to do or not. And it is hard for us to look over our shoulders and look back like it was during the Vietnam, to look over our shoulders and see how uh, there's so much turmoil and lack of support. But I, I, I think, you know, we have to know that uh, in, in uh, the broadest terms that the American people uh, support what we're doing for the reasons that we're doing it. Uh, should we be worried as a country about that the means that we deploy in the world uh, might come back to, and, and, and change us ourselves and our commitment to the values uh, that we have? Sh is, is that something we should worry about? And, and if so, what should we do about Look, it? Look, we, we always need to be thinking about our values whenever we're in engaged in anything, either at home or abroad. We know what we stand for, we know what we believe in, we know what our values are, and we need to stay as true to them as possible. On the other hand, we also need to recognize that when we get involved in these great things, that there will be times when terrible things happen. And then we need to have courage enough to be able to say, look, we've got to correct this problem. We can't let this happen again. And so it's, uh, it, it's difficult, but on the other hand, we can't just be a nation of critics. We, we, need, we need to understand that we're trying to do something to better the world, to make it a better place for our children and ultimately I think everybody else's children. And in this globalizing planet, uh, people's expectations around the world have, have raised quite a bit. I can't imagine any other country on earth better suited to help deal with the problems of globalization and steer people in the right direction, knowing we'll make mistakes than our own. If not us, who? General Abizade, I want to thank you very much for coming to Berkeley, being the Nimitz lecturer, and, and appearing on our program. Thank Thanks, you. It was a great honor. Thank, thank you. Thank you. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history. <laughs>